Today we're going to talk about the book of Daniel. We're going to get to chapter 2, and our topic today is going to be seeking truth in darkness. And uh, I didn't use this illustration last night, but I, I like it. So, oh, I've got to take this sugar out of here first. So, you ever feel in life like this? Now, if you're a Dolphin fan, this is pretty much how you should look most of the year. But the truth, truth be, by the way, all my teams, college teams, won yesterday. I couldn't believe it. It never happens. Like, normally teams call me and say, please don't root for us. So, anyway. So, you ever feel like there's a bag over? Like, you don't know what you're supposed to do next? I used to play a game with youth years ago where we would do that. We'd put a bag on their head, and then they had to listen to their partner who would then tell them where to go, what to do, how to walk between an obstacle course, and they couldn't see. They, they always cheated. They always looked at their feet, and I knew that, but, right? What was funny is sometimes what I would do is instead of having just their partner yell, I would tell everybody to yell. And then the person had no idea who to listen to. That's very true today in our world. Be careful who you listen to as you seek the truth in a world that's as dark. I love it that Denzel to that dark place could bring the idea of love and caring for people. Most people don't know John, who was the only non-martyr disciple, his last words and his last words for years was to love one another. And we forget that there's really two main commands, love God and love people. And so can I tell you this? We're going to give some principles about walking in darkness today, but let me, let me give you this, just, just something to hold on to. If you don't know what to do, love people. If you don't know what to do, then just love the people around you. Go out of your way to be loving to somebody. Because we all get to these places in life where we don't know what we should do for the next step. When you read Daniel chapter 1, I mean, you read the story and it's like Daniel ate the right food and he and his buddies were doing great and they got to meet with the king and the king told him, you're smarter than everybody else. And then we get to chapter 2 and Daniel and his friends are not even in the palace. They're nowhere near it. And then an order goes out to kill him. I don't know about you, that might mess up my day. And too often in life, we're the same way. We have decisions we have to make, things that we have to do and I'm sure in a room this size, there's people today who are sitting here going, I've got to make a decision. I've got to figure out what I can do next. Now, I want to remind you that when Jesus taught us the Lord's Prayer, he did not say, give me today my monthly bread. Daily bread. And too often we worry about something that's way on the horizon and not even able to deal with today. And so today I want to talk about when you get stressed... I want to encourage you not to give up. When you take, face times of uncertainty, I want you to know that God makes all things possible. But I also want to encourage you that you need a few close friends that can encourage you. I believe that Daniel, the reason we're reading about Daniel is because Daniel was not alone. He also had some good friends who would pray for him, who he could bounce things off of. And so that's the point and what we're going to look at today. There's a lot of directions I could have gone with chapter 2. But my question to you today is there's something in your life that seems impossible today? Is there a circumstance, a situation, a person that you're dealing with that you don't know what to do? You feel like there's a bag over your head? I want to encourage you today. I'm going to give you three steps. and We're going to look at the life of Daniel and look at some New Testament passages to remind us that. Okay, so number one. Yeah, you're going to have to go first title, and then number one. There, there you go. Okay, there's the title. Choices, and then number one. Remember, that is last week's notes. Remember that God opens possibilities. Pretend that's what it says up there. Here's Daniel chapter 2. So you remember Daniel chapter 1, and they were actually going to show it to you, but instead we've decided that we would do chapter 2 today. It says this. The astrologers answered the king, there is no one on earth who can do what the king asks. No king, however great and mighty, has ever asked such a thing of any magician, enchanter, or astrologer. And basically what they're admitting here is, the king said, tell me my dream. Before you interpret it, they said, no, 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 we need your dream first. Why? Because then they can be vague. Then they can pretend that they're giving you some type of palm reading, or card reading, or 
liver reading. I don't know if you knew that's one of the ways they would do it. They would use livers. Doesn't that sound awesome? What king is asked too difficult? No one can reveal it to the king except the gods. Oh, little did they know. And they do not live among humans. This made the king so angry and furious. I love that. It's like he's not just a little mad. He's angry and furious. I didn't know those were two separate things. But apparently they are. Angry and furious that he ordered the execution of all the wise men of Babylon. So the decree was issued to put the wise men to death. And men were sent to look for Daniel and his friends to put them to death. And so the king has a dream, and there's discussion of whether he forgot his dream or whether he knows it, and he's just testing them. And he says, you tell me what it is. I'm tired of you guys pretending you know the future, when the truth is you're just making up stories. And so then he decides, well, let's just kill everybody. Now that's some ultimate power. It's probably a good thing we don't have that much power when we're driving, isn't it? I mean, can you imagine if you're driving, somebody's in the left lane, they're going 35 miles an hour in the left lane on I-95, what you pray would happen to them? That's not good. He actually had that much power. I'm assuming the guy he sent out looked like that guy in Indiana Jones with the big knife. And you remember what Indy does, right? Yeah, I took care of him. Jesus later on was talking about rich people and how it was hard for them to make it into heaven, which freaked the disciples out. Because the Pharisees taught that, that money showed that you were blessed. By the way, if you hear that teaching in a church, you need to be very careful because Americans' version of blessing is very different from the rest of the world. What do we tend to think of when we think of God blessing us? And that's not a small violin, right? Right? We think of it as being money. We think of it as being prosperous. I have actually have pastors that I'm friends with who drive a nice car, nicer than their whole congregation. I say to them, why do you drive that car? You know it's too expensive for you. Oh, because I have to show that God's favor is on my life. Listen, definitely don't look in my car to see if God's favor is on my life. <laughs> That's it. Ricky, you got any detailed jobs? I think I'm going to need... Okay, never mind. So Jesus is talking to the disciples and he's saying it's hard for a rich man to give up his riches to make it into heaven. I mean, it's like if he went through the eye of a needle and even if that is a gate in Jerusalem, it's still such a big deal. So the disciples are like, then nobody can get saved. I mean, if a rich person can't get saved, how can us poor people get saved? And I love what Jesus says here, but it's not just applying to this situation. I want you to see what he says. Jesus looked at them and said, with man, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. Listen, I know when somebody says something to you, or if you're dealing with something at work, or you're dealing with something with a relative, maybe you're dealing with a situation in your life and you don't know what to do next, and you feel like there's a bag over your head, I just want to remind you that God loves to do the impossible. And I feel like so often when we pray, God may not answer the prayer the way you want. By the way, I pray that way sometimes. I'm like, you know, God, this is what I want. Would you do this? It'd be great if you would do this. But guess what? God doesn't always do what I want. But one of the things I've noticed over and over again is so often, even when God doesn't change a circumstance, doesn't change a situation, you know what he changes? Me. Eric, I'm going to walk you through this. You know, every once in a while, somebody will say, God doesn't give you more than you can handle. And if somebody says that to you, just smile and nod and be nice to them. And then think about what I'm about to tell you, which is God often gives you more than you can handle. Because the point is, you are not the one that needs to handle it. Sometimes you need to say, God, I am too small for this deal. I need you. And that's what Daniel realized he would have to do. Let's look at number two. Confront wisely, connect, and pray. Do you have any friends that you pray with or pray for? I got home last night from Saturday night service. I was watching, or we were listening to the end of the Miami game. 
my University of Miami fans aren't here. You have no idea what I just did. And uh, got home, and then late last night, one of my really good pastor friends texted me and said, hey, I've got to take my wife to the... You're only allowed to scream at the end of the service. I know, he's excited. So my friend texted me, and he said, I have to take my wife back to the hospital. She's really sick. And so I sent him about four or five texts, praying for you, of course. Here for you, if I can do anything for you. First thing this morning, I texted him, hey... How's it going? Oh, they're working on this. and They think they've straightened some things out. Do you have a friend like that? Everybody needs someone in their lives that they can talk to. And let me tell you about crazy people. Crazy people either tell everyone everything or tell no one anything. You need a few safe people in your life that you can encourage, that you can pray for, and they can encourage and pray for you. Look at what it looks like in this story. When Arioch, the commander of the king's guard, had gone out to put to death the wise men of Babylon, Daniel spoke to him with wisdom and tact. And I, this is how I picture this conversation taking place. Uh, hey, um, yeah, keep your sword over there for just a second. I, I got to ask you a couple questions. I mean, this guy's sent to your house to kill you. I would be a little nervous. I don't know that tact would be my next thing. But that's what it says here. And what happens? Daniel spoke to him with wisdom and tact. And he asked the king's officer, why did the king issue such a harsh decree? Is that an understatement or not? Arioch then explained the matter to Daniel. At this, Daniel went to the king and asked for time so that he might interpret the dream for him. Then listen to what happens next. Then Daniel returned to his house and explained the matters to his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah, which we also know as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He urged them to plead for mercy from God of heaven concerning this mystery. Why? So that he and his friends might not be executed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. During the night, the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision. Then Daniel praised the God of heaven. Couldn't God have given Daniel this information beforehand? Couldn't, couldn't God have showed him what was going to happen? So, so why does Daniel have to go to the king and say, can you give me some time? And then go to his friends and go, I still don't have an answer. Would you pray that I have an answer? I believe so often we find God in the waiting Some of the hardest things in life are the in-between times. The time when the doctor says, come see me, and you don't know what that means. And so all the way there, you're thinking, what does that mean? What does that mean? What does that mean? And he says, oh, I got a present for you. Here you go. You know, never. That never happens. Right? He's always telling you something. Hey, we caught this. We found this. Or maybe you've got a job situation going on and you know that it's getting bad and you don't know what to do. It's that time in between not knowing what's next. How many of you have changed at least one job in your life? Yeah, pretty easy, right? Most of you. Most of you have gone from one place to the other. Most people forget how hard that time between the time you felt like you were supposed to leave or maybe you were encouraged to leave. Maybe you were encouraged with a pink note to leave. Maybe you were walked out at the Space Center on a Friday afternoon with your key not working. By the way, some of the worst stories I've heard is people who showed up at work and their key didn't work. Oh no. We often forget that part later because now we've moved on and we realize how much better life is and how God guided us through that situation or that circumstance. But the truth is when we're in between and we're fearful, you know what we need? A friend who we can say, would you pray for me? If you don't have anybody like that, I want to encourage you to begin. I I love that we have small groups at our church. I encourage you. I lead two of them. I'm getting ready to lead three of them. I encourage you to get in one of those so you can get to know other people. But you don't even have to be that official. You, You can find somebody that you can say, hey, you want to meet me once a month for breakfast? Hey, you want to meet me once a month for lunch? Maybe we can just get together and I can pray for you and you can pray for me. We all need that person. And what happens is we get so busy in life looking for the next Netflix show. 
but we haven't gone out of our way to look for people that not only we can be blessed by, but we can bless by praying for them. When's the last time you called somebody or texted somebody and said, I just want you to know I'm praying for you? Daniel's first response was not mine. You know what my first response would be to someone wants to kill you? It usually looks like this. What? I did a wedding years ago. A policeman came to me and said, just so you know, there's been a death threat on the bride, so you'll want to wear this jacket. I said, is the bride wearing a jacket? He said, no, she refused to wear one. I said, then I'm not wearing one either. Can I tell you that I looked in the back a lot during that wedding? <laughs> Do you? You may kiss the bride. Let's go. Right. That really happened. It freaked me out. I'm telling you the story 20-something years later, right? If I was Daniel, I would have been like, why is the king so harsh in his command? I mean, I said, because Daniel knew to, who to trust. When you go through the book of Daniel and you see all the times that God allowed Daniel to go through these circumstances where the bag was on his head and he didn't know what was next. I mean, you, you realize that God could have made it where Daniel did not even fall into the lion den. Like we could have read that story and it could have said, and God made Daniel float above the lion's den for 24 hours. I'm sure as Daniel was on his way down in the lion's den, he's like, well, I thought God was going to save me. God could have kept Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego out of the furnace. But he didn't. Why? Because the whole point is that God is with us during those times. And if we're honest, the truth is sometimes our best prayers come from those moments in life that we don't know what's next or what we're supposed to do. So I encourage you to get a friend who you can say, would you pray for me? I'm just struggling. And a friend that you can say, I'm praying for you. I know you're struggling. In James 5.16, it says it this way, Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other. Why? So you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. So many of us don't realize we even need to be healed. If you're trying to do life by yourself, then you're probably very broken and don't even know it. My pastor used to say he was so spiritual till he got around people. And then he had kids, and he said, all these little mirrors were walking around my house showing me all my faults. Do you have somebody who will pray for you, where you can confess, when you can make things right? Once again, a crazy person tells everybody everything, and a crazy person doesn't tell anyone anything. But a person who wants to grow in their walk with Christ will look for a few close friends friends who can encourage them. That's what Daniel did. That's what we're encouraged to do in the New Testament. I heard this Native American expression, and I don't know if I have it exactly right, but it said, you can run faster alone, but you can run farther with others. And I know, I know where you work. You're saying, I'd rather work alone in my cubicle than with other people. I understand. Because everything is great until you're around people. Like, I can do the love God thing all day long. Love God. And then he said, love people. I'm like, well, do I have to do the second one? Can I just do the first one? And then he says, the second is like the first. It's like, if you really love God, you're going to love people. But I don't like people. It doesn't say you have to like them. But the truth is, when you start to recognize your brokenness, you realize that your friends are also broken, and that's why you need to pray for each other. The first thing Daniel did is he said to his friends, would you pray that I would get an answer from God? If you're dealing with an uncertainty and feel like there's a bag over your head, can I encourage you to text that friend, to email that friend, to call that friend? Calling is an app on your phone. And when you talk into it, you can hear the other person. It's amazing. It's a lot like texting, but different. Number three. Seek God and give Him glory. I, I think this is really 
so many times where we break down because we pray and we ask God to help us. And then when he helps us, we forget that we asked him. We've already moved on to the next problem, the next speed bump, right? Most of us go through life just looking at the next speed bump. We know what's coming and we forgot what passed. When's the last time you looked back and said, God, thank you for helping me make it this far. God, thank you for helping me walk through this day. Too often we're praying for retirement bread. Instead of daily bread, God, show me what you want me to do today. Do you have friends who you can do that with? I'll never forget the first time I, had, I was a chaplain at my school for a little while and I had Peter Lord come and talk to chapel. Everybody loved him because he did a lot of illustrations. Nobody fell asleep. It was amazing. And I remember I ate lunch with him and his wife afterwards and we sat down to eat and I said, that was so good today. And he immediately looked at me and goes, no, nah, it wasn't very good. I could have done, oh, I should have talked about this. And he just went on and on about all the things he did wrong. And I thought, oh, he's human. <laughs> and I'll never forget his wife, Johnny, who was the sweetest thing ever, reached over to him and said, it's okay, you did great. Everybody always said, Peter, preach the right things, but Johnny, lived the right things. The truth is, we all are broken and messed up, and so we have to realize, God, I need your help, even on the simplest thing, even dealing and loving and caring about people. Lord, I need your help. And that's what Daniel told his friends to pray, and then here's what happens next. He got the word from God, and then the king asked Daniel also called Belteshazzar, are you able to tell me what I saw in my dream and interpret it? Now, notice his first sentence is exactly what the other guys said. No wise man, enchanter, magician, or diviner can explain to the king the mystery he's talked about, comma. I don't know about you, that would not have been my first sentence. I mean, if he's got guys standing next to him that look like Raiders of the Lost Ark with the big knives, I'm thinking, maybe I'll start with the good news. But Daniel wants the king to know, I can't do this in my own power. And so he continues. But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. He has shown King Nebuchadnezzar what will happen in the days to come. Your dreams and visions that pass through your mind as you were lying on the bed are these. And then Daniel goes into that whole prophecy. That's not really our focus today, but it's a pretty neat prophecy about a statue and toes and all kind of cool stuff in there. And then a few verses later, the king said to Daniel, Surely your God... And Daniel said, don't call me Shirley. That's, that's, not, what, that's not in here. Okay. Surely your God is the God of gods and the Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries. For you were able to reveal this mystery. Then the king placed Daniel in a high position, laughed, uh, lavished many gifts on him. By the way, some of the gifts they liked giving in, ba in Babylon were gold and frankincense and myrrh. Just so you know, it's just kind of a coincidence, isn't it? He made him ruler over the entire province of Babylon and placed him in charge of all of its wise men. I wonder how the wise men knew about the star and the Messiah. Huh. Moreover, at Daniel's request, the king appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego administrators over the province of Babylon while Daniel himself remained at the royal court. Just a few verses before this, Daniel had a death sentence on his head. And now he's in charge. I know your life may feel like a bag over your head right now. And you don't know what's next. And you're discouraged. And you're frustrated. And you're aggravated. And all the other emotions that go along with being mistreated by people. By the way, Daniel's first response could have been, That's not fair. Because that's my first response. I didn't do anything. And instead, Daniel said, I'm going to seek God first. Are you seeking God in your life for the next step? In Romans 8, it reminds us when that bag is over your head, when you don't know what's next, when the darkness comes and you're trying to define what the truth is and what you're supposed to do, it says this, and we know that in all things, God works for the good, not just anybody, of those who love him, so first, your motivation is right. And then it says, who've been called according to his purpose. You know what that means? 
Every day God has given you not only a grand purpose, but a purpose for you. God's allowed people to be in your life. There are people you work with that God has allowed them to be in your life. Some of them are your sandpaper. Congratulations. Others are your healing oil. And God has called you in this world that is full of sin and danger and death. By the way, this is not heaven yet. And instead of crying out, it's not fair, it's not fair, it's not fair, maybe we should start saying, God, would you show me what I'm supposed to do next? And when you don't know, can I tell you that loving people is always a good start? Because no matter how much you're struggling, no matter what you're dealing with, God will give you an opportunity to love people. My mom doesn't get around as well as she used to. She actually took a fall this week and she's fine. But you know what my mom found time to do this week? She has figured out that she can ship gifts to people in the church. If you haven't got one yet, just wait. She's going to get all of you. And she's figured out even with bruised ribs, even when she's not getting around really well, that she can send somebody a note and a gift that just says, I just want you to know you're loved. What's our excuse? Too often we're so focused on us. One of the neatest things I ever did years ago was a college adoption program. Our church was right next door to Florida Tech down in Melbourne. And I saw there were some folks in the church that had kind of taken on a couple of students. And I thought, that is a great idea. I'm going to have families adopt students. So I made up a list and I said to the students, if you want to be adopted by a family to eat with them at least once a month, that was the minimum requirement. They had to feed them once a month. I said, if you want to be a part of it, sign up. Oh my gosh, the college students all signed up. Home cooked meal, are you crazy? And they began adopting those students and they would take them. It started out as once a month, they would feed them a meal, but then it became once every couple of weeks, come wash your clothes at my house. Come have some cookies. I brought you a dessert. Almost 30 years later, I talked to one of those college students recently and I said, are you still in touch with your adoptive parents? He said, absolutely. I just talked to them the other day. You never know what impact going out of your way to just be obedient to God, no matter what the circumstance, no matter how difficult it is, no matter how you feel like you're walking in darkness, you may be the one who brings change not just to another person, but to many people. I know Daniel had no idea the influence he was going to have. When he was writing down these stories, uh, uh, as he's looking back and he's writing down these stories in chapter 2, this time in Aramaic, I don't know, he just decided, well, I can speak a couple languages, I'll just write this in a different one. But he had no idea that here thousands of years later, we're still reading that story and reminded that God's with us, even in the storm, even in the trial. So I'm praying today that whatever you're walking through, that you could take that and just say, God, I need your help. That if you haven't developed friendships with others, that instead of thinking church is looking at the back of someone's head, that instead you would realize church is about getting to know someone. Why? So that you can pray for them, but also so that they can pray for you. If you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, you can do that today. I'll be here after the service and you can say, Eric, what does it mean to be a Christian? I know that Jesus died on a cross. I know all that stuff. I've heard those stories. What does that mean? And becoming a Christian means surrendering your life to him the way you've always done things. Saying, God, I, I want to be yours. How do you want me to do life? If you're ready to do that today, I'd love to talk to you after the service. If you're here today and you're one of the people I talked about that feels like there's a bag over your head right now, can I encourage you to ask a friend to pray for you? To go out of your way and say, would you pray that I have wisdom and what to do next? And then the Bible says you just have to be obedient to God. And guess what? He'll work all things out for the good. Not everything is good, but he's going to work it out for the good. Would you join me as we close in prayer today? Father, thank you so much for the example of Daniel that under all this pressure, Father, 
the first thing he did was pray. The first thing he did was connect with friends who would pray for him. Lord, may we do that in our lives. Father, you said that the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. So I pray, Lord, that you would bring just people who love us and love you into our lives to pray for us. Lord, that you would guide our steps every day. Lord, for that one who today is full of anxiety because of a decision they need to make or a problem that they have, Lord, would you today just lift their burdens just from them being here? Father, I thank you for your word and your power in your word. Bless each one here. In Jesus' name, amen.